Good morning, Antioch. Good morning. All right, Ezra's here. All right. Let's get up on our feet and sing hymn number 136. Are you washed in the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. What a great, great song. And question to start church off. You can have a quick seat if you'd like. Young people, you are having a pool party. This is a sanctified pool party on June 15th. We want to say a big thank you to Hans and Judy Carter for opening up their beautiful property and pool for us from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So come out and remember, fellas and ladies, somebody got on me and said, well, Pastor Dave, you picked on the ladies about no crack front or back. So guys, no Speedos. Do not show up. You will be escorted immediately off of the premises. Amen. All right. Wanted to remind everybody just one more time just about the awesome gift that we were able to give because of the amazing gift that we received from the members of Slate Hill Baptist Church. Remember that when you give, it enables us to be generous. So praise the Lord for all the missions that we are helping and that we are enabling to do the work of God. Amen. Thank you so much, Antioch, for your faithfulness in giving. Now, VBS is happening the last week of June, 6 p.m. is when registration and dinner starts. Something for all ages. Don't miss it. Show up. Bring your neighbors, bring your friends, and even bring your enemies. We'll love them to death. Praise the Lord. All right. Baby bottle campaign is kicking off. The bo baby bottles are in the back. This benefits Life Spring Pregnancy Center. So if you would, for your spare change, grab a couple baby bottles on your way out. Fill them up, and they're due back August the 4th. Every baby bottle that we fill, all the proceeds go to support Life Spring Pregnancy Center in Charlottesville. Now, if you don't, if you would like to mow the grass here at the church, we are always looking for volunteers to do that. So contact the church office if you'd like to give your time in that way to serve God's house and keep the yard looking so fresh and so clean. Clean. Amen. All right. If you don't know who your deacon is, Take a few minutes at the end of this service and watch as the slideshow will be playing, showing you who your deacon is here at Antioch Baptist Church. And we are in the season for nominating deacons. So we need all the members of the church to get your deacon nomination form. Review it, read it. It has all the qualifications from the Bible, from 1 Timothy chapter 3. It also has the qualifications from our church constitution of what a person needs to be in order to be nominated as a deacon so be praying about that get the, get your deacon nomination form at the back and those are due those nomination forms are due by june the 30th all right at this time i'm going to ask our brother darren mccauley to come and make a presentation on behalf of the pat weaver scholarship committee You want me to call it Maddie Vote? Is that the name you want? Or I should have just called Ezra. <laughs> On behalf of the Antioch Baptist Church, Pat Weaver Scholarship Committee, and Don Weaver, it's our honor to award scholarships to three deserving individuals this year. Mr. Weaver has joined us this morning to be a part of the, the presentation here. He's worked diligently to set up this scholarship fund in honor of his wife, Pat Weaver, a longtime member of Antioch Baptist Church. 
The scholarship recipients are members of Antioch, have maintained high grades, shown leadership abilities, and are furthering their education. As your name is called, please come forward to be recognized and to receive your scholarship. Miss Sierra Kennedy. She'll be attending Virginia Tech to study animal science. Miss Madison Vogt. She'll be attending Arizona State to study business law. And Miss Harley Kirby, who is attending Longwood University, studying criminology and sociology. <clears throat> Congratulations to these three scholarship recipients. We look forward to your continued success in school, as well as your leadership and service to others as you move forward in life. If we could uh, please join together in prayer, leading into our music worship. Dear Lord, as we come to you now and worship, we pray for open mouths to lift up your voices, to lift up our voices to you. It is such a delight for us to be able to give you thanks and to sing praises to your name. We pray for open ears that we can hear your voice. You desire this very moment to speak to each and every one of us with a very special message designed for each individual that hears this today. We pray for open hearts to receive your wisdom, your leading, your guidance. It's coming to us today. Dear Lord, we pray for open hearts that we can receive it so that we can take it into our communities this week as we go forward. Open us to hear you and to obey you. For it's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get up on our feet this morning. Get this worship thing going on. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King.
Oh, let's give him praise, church. Our living hope. Lord, we just praise you and thank you that you are our living hope. We praise you and thank you, God. That while we were dead in our sins and dead in our trespasses, God, you came down, you intervened. But you made a way where there was no way. The great chasm of our sin that separated us from a holy God. Jesus, you came down from heaven and you died on the cross. And when you shed your precious blood, You satisfied the wrath of God and you paid once and for all the price. Lord, you paid my penalty. Lord, we just praise you and thank you for that this morning. We pray that you will bring us from woe to worship. Lord, bring us from a place of depression and desolation to a place of forgiveness and deliverance. Lord, I just ask that we will not be like the Israelites, Lord, as we have heard week after week after week. And we will continue to hear for the next few months the warnings from your word, from your mouth. Where you are trying to get your people's attention and tell us to wake up and to repent. To turn from our wicked, rebellious ways. To stop taking your grace and your mercy for granted. To stop being so excited about earthly, worldly, carnal things and so disinterested in holy things. Lord, I pray that you do by your spirit, Lord, because that's the only way it will happen because it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by your spirit, declares the Lord. But Lord, as we go to your word this morning, I just, I just pray, Lord, as, as Darren prayed and as Dewey prayed, Lord, for open eyes, open ears, and open hearts. I pray that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in the ever so popular and renowned book of Zephaniah this morning. Sandwiched right in between Habakkuk and Haggai. Many of you, that doesn't help at all. I'm on page 944 in the Blue Bibles. The table of contents is your friend this morning. Amen. We're going to read Zephaniah. We're going to read the whole third chapter. When you found it, somebody say amen in God's house. All right, we've got about a dozen people there. The rest of you, we'll put it on the screen for you. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Woe to the city that is rebellious and defiled, the oppressive city. She has not obeyed. She has not accepted discipline. And she has not trusted in Yahweh. She has not drawn near to her God. The princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are wolves of the night, which leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary, and they do violence to instruction. The righteous Lord is in her. He does no wrong. He applies his justice morning by morning. He does not fail at dawn, yet the one who does wrong knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their corner towers are destroyed. I have laid waste their streets with no one to pass through. Their cities lie devastated without a person and without an inhabitant. I thought, you will certainly fear me and accept correction. Then her dwelling place will, would not be cut off based on all that I had allocated to her. However, they became more corrupt in all their actions. Therefore, wait for me. This is the Lord's declaration. Until the day I rise up to plunder, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, in order to pour out my indignation on them, all my burning anger, for the whole earth will be consumed by the fire of my jealousy. For I will then restore pure speech to the peoples so that all of them may call on the name of Yahweh and serve him with a single purpose. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my supplicants, my dispersed people will bring an offering to me 
on that day you will not be put to shame because of everything you have done in rebelling against me for then I will remove your proud arrogant people from among you and you will never again be haughty on my holy mountain I will leave a meek and humble people among you and they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh the remnant of Israel will no longer do wrong or tell lies a deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths but they will pasture and lie down with nothing to make them afraid. Sing for joy, daughter of Zion, and shout loudly, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has removed your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The King of Israel, Yahweh, is among you. You need no longer fear harm. On that day it will be said to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. Yahweh your God is among you, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will bring you quietness with his love. And he will delight in you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals. And they will be a tribute from you and a reproach on her. Yes, at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather the scattered. I will make those who were disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at that time, I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes. For Yahweh has spoken. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus, for the hope that we have in the coming kingdom of heaven, for the hope that we have that one day you will make all the wrongs right. You will come and establish your kingdom on the earth and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I pray that this morning that we will heed the warning, woe to the rebellious. Lord, those of us who, although we hear, although we study, although we read, although we listen, but we still refuse to put your word into practice and let your word rule over our thoughts and over our actions and over our emotions and over every activity that we do under the sun. I pray we will hear the warning. Lord, give us the strength to wait on you lord in these uncertain perilous times lord in the times where the, the the people of the earth are sinful and corrupt and the rulers of the earth are sinful and corrupt and lord there are many who claim to be proclaimers of your word but they are calling what is right wrong and what is wrong right and lord i just pray that lord you will help the faithful who are here give us the strength to wait upon you strengthen us and Lord, I pray that we will worship our warrior king like never before. Because you are, Jesus, you are the warrior that saves. You waged war on death, hell, and sin. And you triumphed and you conquered over all. You defeated them. You made public spectacle of all hell had to offer on the cross. And you defeated them when you rose from the grave. Lord, you are our warrior king. I pray we will give you the praise due your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You can be seated. This morning we were hoping to go from woe to worship. Now Zephaniah tells us a lot about himself in verse 1 of his, prop of his prophecy, chapter 1. Verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. So here we have Zephaniah, who is the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah, and that is significant because he's the first prophet to come from a royal line. There is He, he comes from a royal lineage. His great-great-grandfather was the king of Judah, and that is so significant because we see a foreshadowing of Jesus, who would be the royal prophet, the king of kings, and the lord of lords. Now, uh, Zephaniah's prophecy and his preaching led the nation of Judah 
to national reform and revival under King Josiah. You can read about King Josiah in 2 Chronicles chapter 22. Josiah became the ruler of Judah when he was just eight years old. Can you imagine having a national leader that is eight years old? I think today I would take that over 80 and senile, which is what we have. I think I'd like to try the reverse. Let's try it. Who knows? Maybe the, you know, president watching Coco Melon. We may get somewhere. Josiah found, what happened is Josiah, they found the book of the law. God's people had gotten so far from God, they didn't even know where their Bibles were. And I think in America, we are in the same boat where we have gotten away from the Bible. They rediscovered the Bible, and then they returned to the Lord. And Josiah was the last righteous king that Judah had until he was killed in battle. And then shortly after, two kings after Josiah, Babylon comes and conquers and defeats Judah. So Zephaniah's theme is the day of the Lord. And we know the day of the Lord is that period of time where God will judge the nations and usher in his righteous kingdom. The theme is found in all of the prophets, but it is the major theme uh, in in Joel and in Zephaniah. Zephaniah 1.14 says, The great day of the Lord is near. And I'm here to remind the people of God, the great day of the Lord is near. Zephaniah was prophesying and giving warning to the people and teaching them and urging them to go from woe to worship. And this morning, I think God wants America to wake up and repent, to seek him, to turn from our wickedness. And I'm praying that just like Judah had one revival, one more revival right before their downfall, I am praying God, pour out your spirit on us one more time. Give us one more chance to seek you and turn the tide of this wicked and evil culture. This morning, God is calling out to us, urging us to hear and heed his word. I see all the, I love, I love that we have so many babies at Antioch. I just have to say that. Here's what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the America they're going to grow up in. I'm concerned about the America they will live in. If we want to see something different, church, we have to do something different. We've got to live this. That's off the notes, but anyway. Just as God promises through Zephaniah to save a remnant of Israel and to keep his covenant to Abraham, God in his word promises to save all who call on his name from the coming wrath and judgment. Remember what Paul said about the day of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says about the times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written for you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction comes on them. Like labor pains come on a pregnant woman. They will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to overtake you like a thief. For you are sons and daughters of the light and sons and daughters of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness, so then we must not sleep like the rest. But we must stay awake and be serious. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, we must be serious and put on the armor of faith and love on our chest and put on the helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or whether we are asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. This morning, I want us to go from woe to worship. God wants to move you from a place of torment to a place of transformation. God wants to take some of you from being destined for hell, and he wants you to be headed to heaven through faith in Jesus. God wants to take some of us from lust to love, from deception and depression to deliverance. Let's stop ignoring God's word and let's start inviting God's word into our hearts. God wants to take us from hopeless to hopeful this morning. Amen. And hope is a great motivation for obedience. And that's why as we have seen all of the prophets, they end on a hopeful note. And we have hope in Jesus, Jesus Christ, our living hope. Amen. 
If we will submit to God's word and to his will and do what he commands, we have the hope of heaven and we can enjoy fellowship with God now. We have hope that God will keep his promises because he is the faithful God that will one day judge the nations in righteousness and bring in his kingdom. And since God is faithful in keeping his promises, God's people should be faithful to obey his word. To go from woe to worship this morning, you need to hear the warning. You need to learn to wait upon the Lord, and we need to worship our warrior. Amen. Point number one, he says, woe to the rebellious in verse one of chapter three. Woe to the rebellious. When we think of woe, many times I think we think woe is me. Woe is me. Feel sad for me. Don't you see how bad I have it? Don't you see how hard it is for me? Don't you see how everybody else has it so much better than me? Woe is me. Let me tell you, when God pronounces woe, he is pronouncing judgment to a people or to a nation. It's a warning of devastating judgment and desolation that is coming. It is a certainty. We're going to read about it a little bit later, but everything on this planet is going to burn and melt like wax, the Bible says. You ain't going to save, you ain't going to stop global warming by throwing your, your plastic water bottle in the recycling. One day it's all going to burn anyway. You should still recycle, amen, if that's what you feel like you should do. But God says, woe to Jerusalem. He says, the city that is supposed to be the holy city is filled with everything but holiness. And sometimes I look at the church today and I, we can look at our own lives and we see, boy, the, the lives of holy people, we are filled with everything but holiness. We're filthy. God's people were rebellious and defiled. They were a sinning people. They refused to obey. They refused to accept discipline. They refused to trust and draw near to God. I think about Ezra sometimes when I tell him, Ezra, if you don't do that, daddy's going to give you a whooping. And sometimes if he's, if he's wound up in a certain kind of way, he will look at me and he will say, do it. Do it, dad. Do it. <laughs> it kind of it takes you back a little bit. And then it breaks your heart when you have to do it. But they refuse to obey. Does that describe you? I just wonder. Look at verse 2. She has not obeyed. She has not accepted discipline. She's not trusted in Yahweh. And she has not drawn near to her God. Does that describe your life this morning? Are, is he talking about you in verse 2 of chapter 3 of Zephaniah? Or have you stubbornly continued to sin despite knowing what God's word says? Many of us have, all of us have at one point or another. And the thing about rebellion is sometimes rebellion gets painted in a very romantic light, especially now. You know, people are dissatisfied with the state of the country and they're talking about, well, we need to rebel, right? We think of rebellion, we think of teenagers. We think of teenagers that just no matter how many times you tell them, you, they don't think, they don't believe you, they don't listen, they do whatever they want anyway. Some of you, you hear rebel and you think of James Dean, right? You think of rebel without a cause. You think of a, of a handsome guy and nice jeans and a plain white t-shirt and a leather jacket with the collar flipped up saying, well, I don't care what anybody says. Some of us think of sticking it to the man. Yeah, let's be rebels. Well, the Bible says that rebellion against God is as the sin of witchcraft. You might as well drink animal blood and play with a Ouija board. Rebellion against God is making your own bed in the pits of hell. We need to submit to God and draw near to God and seek his forgiveness for our sin. We need to repent for our sin, to turn away from our sin, to admit our guilt and humbly ask for God's grace and then respond to God's grace with obedience. Woe to the rebellious. He says their leaders had become godless. In verses 3 and 4, Zephaniah describes the godless leadership of Judah like wild animals, like ravenous beasts that oppressed the people and took whatever they wanted. The priests were faithless and would not proclaim God's truth. And God had spoken to his people time and time again, but they had turned his house into a toxic place polluted with sin, and puffed up with pride. And Jesus told the same thing to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26. He said, Woe to you, 
scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside will also become clean. We are so good at looking so good on the outside. But God knows the condition of your heart. And this morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking to some of you saying, you're filthy. You need a bath. You need to be washed with the water of the word and repent of your sin. God says he has cut off nations in verse 6. And if you don't think America can be cut off like that, you are living in a fantasy world. There is certain judgment coming from God against the United States of America. I'm telling you, it is coming. Otherwise, God would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah and say, sorry, I'm playing by a different set of rules now. He's not. When it comes to the nations, God will judge this country. We cannot murder over two million babies every year and think God will just smile at that. God is shocked at Israel here, and he's shocked at America this morning that in spite of his mercy and warning the people that we are more corrupt than ever before. Jerusalem streets were laid waste, and the city was destroyed by Babylon. Some of us need to hear and be reminded, God never gives empty warnings. He means business. I read a story about a newspaper that was in Messina, Sicily, and it was published on December 25th, on Christmas Day in 1908. They printed an article against God, and in this article, they were, they were mocking God, and they were saying, God, if you're real, in this article, they said, God, if you're real, then send an earthquake. Three days later, that city was devastated by a terrible earthquake that killed over 84,000 people. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a person soweth, that will they also reapeth. If we can quote the King James this morning. Woe to the rebellious. We are not, we are not exempt from the judgment of God when our leaders are godless. When our president on Easter Sunday will declare it Trans Awareness Day on Resurrection Sunday. I mean, God help us. That didn't, that didn't happen in Great Britain. That happened in America. Well, on a day where we're supposed to honor the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And then people, ignorant people on social media, well, a day can be more than one thing. Foolish, foolish, arrogant, sinful people. We need to cry out and plead to God for mercy and for a revival. And until he sends one, we need to learn point number two, which is to wait on God. In verses 8 through 13, God says, wait for me. He's telling us, his people, wait for me. Now, we have to learn how to slow down. We have to learn to, to take time to wait upon the Lord. We have to learn to trust his timing. Because for many of us, I know I can feel it. I'm with you. We look around and we, and we see this corruption and we see this wickedness. And many of us cry out, oh God, how long will you allow this to happen? God will rise up for the plunder. He will bring an end to all things and usher in his perfect kingdom. But we have to wait for him. And we have to maintain, and we have to love and connect and go and grow until he returns. He promises to restore and renew our hearts. He promises to heal the land. He promises, I love this, to remove the proud and the arrogant people from among us. Now, don't look around. But he promises to remove the proud and arrogant people from among us. He promises to remove the liars and the deceivers and to leave a meek and hum humble people among us that will be able to take refuge in him and in his name. There will come a day when children, no, children, no child will starve in America or any other place on the earth. There will come a day when no one is cheated, where no one is betrayed, and where no one dies ever again. But we have to wait on God. People like to tell us, oh, there is no God. Nothing happens after you die. 
People have been talking about Jesus coming back for centuries, and it hasn't happened, and it never will happen. Let me tell you, remember what God tells us in the book of 2 Peter. Well, we just pray your anointing on that children's church worker. Amen. Send a special anointing down the hallway. First, he says in 2 Peter, verse 3, First, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, living according to their own desires, saying, Where is the promise of the Lord's coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. Don't we hear that today? Peter, first Peter is saying, look, Second Peter is telling us, look, it's going to happen. People are going to mock it. They're going to mock you for believing it. They're going to tell you, look, people have been saying this forever. It's never going to happen. Dear friends, don't let this one thing escape you. Verse 8 of chapter 3 of Second Peter. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some of us understanding delay, but he is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and on that day the heavens and the earth will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, it is clear what sort of people we should be in holy conduct and godliness as we wait and earnestly desire the coming day of the Lord. As we wait for it and earnestly desire it we have to be holy in our conduct he continues the heavens will be on fire and be dissolved because of it and the elements will melt with the heat but based on his promise we wait for the new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will dwell therefore dear friends while you wait for these things make every effort to be found at peace with him without spot or blemish amen we got our orders. We're told what we are to do. We have to wait. It reminds me of a song that my mom used to sing to me when I would be impatient, impatient as a kid. And she would look at me and she would say, Be patient, be patient, don't be in such a hurry. Anybody know that song? Right? When you're impatient, it only causes worry. Right? Remember, remember that God is patient too. And think of all the times when someone else has had to wait for you. Amen. We've got to wait on the Lord, and we have to be faithful. God will do all that he has promised to do, but we are called to wait upon him because it is those that wait upon the Lord that will renew their strength and will mount up on wings like eagles. While we wait, we work out our fear, our salvation with fear and trembling. We make every effort to be found at peace with God. Well, you can never be at peace with God if you are piled deep in unrepentant sin. You'll never find peace with God. We make every effort. We wait, and we are holy in our conduct and in godliness. While we wait, and while we wait, most importantly, we have to worship our warrior as the worship team comes. Worship our warrior. I love what he says in verse 17. Yahweh, your God among you, is a warrior who saves he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will bring you quietness with his love. He will delight in you with shouts or songs of joy. Verse 14 says, sing for joy, daughter Zion, and shout loudly, Israel. Oh, man, I love that. Shout loudly. Some of us have a lot of work to do on our worship between now and heaven. Amen. Let's start, let's start practicing now. Be glad smile you're going to heaven that's good news rejoice he says with all of your heart be glad and rejoice with all your heart the Lord has removed your punishment he has turned back your enemy and the king of Israel Yahweh is among you wow what an amazing promise jump dance leap for joy the lord has removed our punishment he has defeated our enemies and the king is among us now what i know about the king of kings is he does not release his presence in a place where he is not honored and the holy spirit does not move in a place where he is not welcome and to be quite blunt and frank many times our worship is pathetic 
It's pathetic. This is the pep rally. This is how we fight our battles. I'm convinced nothing reveals a prideful and rebellious heart more clearly than a lack of engagement and worship to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We either, A, we feel, oh, I'm too dignified to act like that, Pastor Dave. You mean you're too dignified to act like that? Here, we've seen how you can act out there. We've seen how you can act. We've seen when, when, when the Redskins are, they're not the Redskins, when the Commanders or when UVA wins a game, I've seen how you can act. Or B, we fear the opinion of the people around us. Well, I don't want other people to see me acting that way. Or maybe C, we've never truly been saved. Maybe we don't understand the grace of God. Or D, we, we've never done it, so I've never worshipped that way, so I won't worship that way. Or E, we won't, we won't do it. I won't do it just because the pastor told me to. I ain't going to raise my hands because the pastor told me to. I had someone tell me that once. Well, you told me to do it, so I'm never going to do it. And I'm like, do you realize that is the exact definition of rebellion? The Bible tells you to. The Bible tells you to sing for joy, to dance, and to leap because God has taken your sin and he nailed it on the cross and you can act uninterested. Repent before a holy God. It gets me so angry. And we wonder why the world's not interested. We worship God for one ultimate reason. It doesn't have anything to do with Dave Vogt. Forget Dave Vogt. Forget Dewey Partouche. Forget DJ Carter. Forget Madeline Hazlip. Forget everybody that's ever stood on this stage. It has nothing to do with that. We worship God for one reason. He is worthy to be praised. He deserves it. He has earned it. And he has saved you so that you can be free to do it. That's why. That's why. And I know some of us were taught that's not what you do in church. Well, you know what? Maybe it's time to learn something new. We should go nuts on Sunday for Jesus. We should go absolutely wild for Jesus. We should be crazy for Jesus in worship in our homes and in our cars. People should be looking at you at the stoplight and they should go, I want whatever they got. Why? Because the Lord is among us, a warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness and he will bring you quietness with his love. Oh, there is a time to get loud in worship and there is such a sweet time to get quiet in worship. There's a holy hush that should fall on the saints of God where God whispers to our hearts, where he silences the voice of the enemy, where he quiets our minds, where he calms our fears. And I love those times. But I cannot wait for the fulfillment of verse 17 where it says that Jesus shouts over us. God sings over us with shouts of joy. I cannot wait until that day when I see my Savior face to face and he looks at me and he says, yes, you made it. <laughs> I didn't know for a while. I know the end from the beginning and you were making me a little bit nervous. You made it. When he looks at us and he says, well done, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your reward. That day is coming, church. We celebrate it. We worship it now because Jesus has finished it on the, on the cross. And we worship in anticipation for that day is surely coming to us. I don't know when all the ins and outs and how it will all be worked out, but I know one thing. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. I remember there was a janitor at Bethel, the church where I had my, my theological training and upbringing. And I, I would just do anything. I would do anything that needed to be done. I loved being in, in, in the house. I loved being in church. I was always helping out. I remember late one night, the, the janitor was standing outside the bathroom. And he was waiting for the floor to dry. He's reading his Bible. 
So I walked up to him and said, man, you're reading your Bible. That, that's awesome. What are you reading? He said, I'm reading the book of Revelation. I said, man, that's great. I love that book, but it's so confusing to me. I said, do you understand it? He said, yeah, I understand it fine. I said, man, that's amazing. Would you mind explaining it to me? He said, yeah. And he closed his Bible. Jesus wins. And he went back to cleaning. It's as simple and as easy as that. No matter what happens in November, no matter what happens in the days to come, I'm here to remind the people of God, our God wins and he reigns. So we should worship our warrior this morning. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you that you are our Savior King, that you are our worshiping warrior. Lord, that, that you are, Lord, the warrior that saves. You are the warrior that saves, Lord, we worship you, we praise you. And God, I pray to all the rebels without a cause this morning, I pray, oh Lord, that they will repent, that they will turn to you, that they will come to you for salvation. I pray, oh Lord, for all those who are here and they're waiting on you, the faithful ones who are here and they're waiting on you and they're growing weary, I pray you will strengthen them this morning. And I pray that you will stir all of our hearts to worship our warrior king, our warrior savior, Jesus Christ, our living hope, who conquered, defeated, once and for all, death, hell, and the grave, and sin for all time, for all who call on your name. But I pray you will draw the rebels. I pray you will soften our hearts. And I pray you will fill us with excitement and anticipation for your soon and certain return. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to respond, Altars are open this morning.
Yahweh your God is among you. A warrior who saves. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will bring you quietness with his love. He will delight in you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who have been driven from the appointed festivals. They will be a tribute from you and a reproach on her. Yes, at that time, I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather the scattered. I will make those who are disgraced throughout the earth receive praise and fame. At that time, I will bring you back. Yes, at that time, I will gather you. I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, for Yahweh the Lord has spoken. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that you are rejoicing over your people. We praise you and thank you that you are the God who saves. Lord, you have won the victory once and for all. And Lord, I know we all worship, we all worship differently. I pray that one thing we can all do is worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that as we go, as we face the uncertainty of the days ahead, Lord, I pray, oh God, that we will wait on you. I pray, oh Lord, that we will worship you with all of our hearts because it is truly Jesus Christ that is our one and only hope. Lord, may that stir up anticipation and excitement in your people because no matter what else happens, Jesus, you win. We thank you for that. We rest in that. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. Go in peace and victory.